yeah, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, so it's uh, time for some more fun and exciting assembly. Um, so what um, what I'd like to do today is uh, start talking about um, some assembly programming uh, for uh, this machine and how we can do subtraction. Uh, so um, if, uh, so let me actually pull back up the, oops, sorry for the inception. I am really bad at doing that. Uh, get rid of, get rid of Discord. Here we go. Okay, so uh, here is our list of um, options, uh, the different instructions that our CPU is able to execute. And you'll notice that in particular, there's not a single one in there that says the word subtraction. So the question is, how can we do subtraction given uh, this sort of limited instruction set? What, uh, what can we do? Um, all right, so that's sort of the question uh, to, to motivate our discussion. So I'm going to go over to the iPad, and we're going to work out some, some things on paper, uh, and then we'll figure out how to translate that into code. Um, so what I would suggest is keep, um, uh, maybe keep this reference handy. Um, I posted it to Canvas, a uh, link to it. So keep this reference handy as you sort of think about it. All right, so let's go back to um, the iPad. And what I want to talk about is um, how do you do um, subtraction in two's complement. So let's just remind ourselves um, how we did two's complement integer encoding uh, back when we did it. So let's take, for example, the number um, 5 in base 10 which would be 0x05 in hex, or uh, in binary in 8 bits, it would be uh, all zeros. Then we need a 0, a 4, a no 2s, and a 1. OK, so it would be that. Um, OK, so that was how we encoded 5. And so how? Did we encode negative 5 uh, how did we encode negative 5 uh, as an integer uh, not not a, a floating point number uh, okay so how did we do this how did we take the representation for 5 and turn it into the representation for minus 5. So let's get uh, some typing in the chat. Uh, those of you guys who are on Discord uh, can speak. Uh, anybody on the stream chat on Twitch, if you could uh, type a vu. Um, well, really, it would be clavier vu. Yeah. So flip the numbers and add 1. So flip the bits and add 1. So what I needed to do was take that which was 5. And the first thing I needed to do was flip all of the bits and then add 1 to it. And that got me that. And so this rep uh, represents negative 5 uh, as an 8-bit uh, number, 8-bit signed integer. Okay, so uh, that's how we did uh, two's complement uh, back when we were doing all this stuff sort of by hand. And so one reason that I taught you guys this particular method of doing the two's complement work uh, is because this we can program uh, with our operations. Okay, so there really are two operations that we did here.
we needed to flip all the bits and we needed to add the number one to the result. Okay, so addition is easy uh, with our uh, set of instructions. We have an addition instruction and so we would just need to load the number one into some register and add that to the result of flipping all the bits. The flipping all the bits, however, that's the thing that we've got to figure out. How do we do this using the instruction or instructions that we have at our disposal? Okay, so to kind of give us an idea, let me take an example and let's just take these two uh, bits from our original number. One where we started with the zero and that flipped into a one and then the other one where it went the other direction. Okay, so, so I'm just going to take zero and one and I want to do something that flips that to one zero. So it flips each bit. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's think about what options we have at our disposal. Um, the uh, what operations? So we have three operations, or really four, that are basically about moving data from one place to the other. None of those are going to help really in terms of flipping bits. We've got two addition operations. Uh, addition isn't really going to help us flip bits. We don't want to jump or halt. We don't want to do rotate either. And so what this leaves us with are um, um, the three logical operations. Uh, okay, so uh, TGAS, couldn't you just add one to each bit to flip it? Yes, you could. However, um, the instruction for the addition that we have uh, doesn't do bitwise addition it does bitwise addition with carrying so there's no way to add to a specific bit only and disregard any carries that go along if we had a bitwise addition like that uh, then then that would work uh, but we don't the only addition that we have will do carries so for example if you added one and one you would get zero but then the next bit position to the left would get a carry bit and that would screw things up there. Um, so that unfortunately won't work. However, one of the logical operations, if we think about it right, can do it. Okay, so there's actually really two pieces that we've got to crack here. We need to know what goes where the stars are and we need to choose which of the logical operations that we have at our disposal and the operations that we have uh, programmed, or sorry, the operations that we have available from the, the start are AND, OR, and XOR. Um, we can get any of the other logical operations from combinations of those, but as it turns out in this case, we'll only need one logical operation. Okay, so take a minute and think about what could I make the two red stars and what could I make the logical operation to guarantee that I will always exactly flip the bits and everything will work uh, accordingly. So uh, cue up the Jeopardy music. So think for a minute. Teague, let's see if you can figure this one out, bro. Okay. No, O1 doesn't quite work. So, Filippo, you really have to make two choices. You have to choose both the 
the bit pattern for where I've put the stars and a logical operation. Okay, and on the flip side, Teague, you've got, you've thought about and, well, we also need a logical, I mean, a, a, a bit pattern. Okay, so um, let me just go ahead and uh, an and gate would work with 1, 1. All right, so let's try an and with 1, 1 and see what happens. All right, so if I have 0, 1 and 1, 1 and I do a bitwise logical and, then what is 1 and 1? It's 1. And 0 and 1 is 1. Okay, so did this work? Did that flip my bits? It flipped one of the bits, but not the other one. So that didn't quite work. All right. Why is 1 and 1 1? Well, um, what is... What's an AND gate do? What's the truth table for an AND gate? Right. So 0 AND 0 is 1. 0 and 1, or sorry, 0, I'm an idiot. That is the truth table for an AND gate. An AND statement is only true if both constituent parts are true. Okay, and Sam for the the 360 op or op 360 no scope uh, clutch victory. Let's use XOR. Okay, so what is XOR? What is one XOR one? It's zero. What is zero XOR one? It's one. Okay, so using XOR with a pattern of all ones flips bits. Okay, so let's test this on our big number. We had one 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 zero one one. Okay, so that or I'm sorry, that was the result of flipping. Um, we wanted to start with uh, 5, which was that. Okay, so I'm going to take the bit pattern of all 1s, and I'm going to XOR everything against the bit pattern of all 1s. Okay, now um, Teague, the your suggestion about doing addition in a bitwise fashion um, is not how addition works, right, because of the carry bits, but it is how the logical operations work. They work bit by bit, and there's no carrying or anything like that to do um, with any of the logical operations. So, one, so I'm going to work from the right to the left here. One x or 1 is 0. 0 x or 1 is 1. 1 x or 1 is 0. And then the rest of them are all going to be 1. And that is exactly, so this number, or bit pattern, sorry, and that bit pattern are the result, uh, one of them is the flipped version of the other. Okay, so We've cracked the secret here. In order to flip bits, we need to XOR against a bit pattern of all ones. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves, yes. So yes, Filippo, what's your...
Okay, he got it. That's great. So what is one 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 one? What is that in hex? Right, because remember everything is represented on our little machine in hex rather than in binary. So yes, it is in hex ff. Okay, so what this means is that in order to uh, do subtraction, um, we need to um, do uh, flip all the bits and add one. Flipping the bits we can accomplish by doing XOR, adding one, well, that's just addition. Um, okay, so let's switch back over to the computer and uh, let's actually program this thing in. All right, so uh, it looks like we've got a, a guest. Um, all right, so uh, so let's get uh, get programming this in. So those are our operations. We already know that we need to use uh, an AND, or sorry, a, an XOR at one point. We also need to use an addition, and we're going to need to load some things in. Okay, so let me suppose, let me write this program to load the number found in memory cell F0, negate it, and output to F1. Okay, so we'll just take it in from someplace and negate it. All right, so in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is actually load the number in that we're dealing with. So I'm going to load, oops, um, register 1 with the bit pattern, uh, or sorry, the data that's found in F0. I'm going to, um, then we need to load in two other pieces of data. So we needed the number FF um, because that's something that we used in order to flip bits. We also need to load in the number 1. So I'm going to go ahead and load in everything from the get-go. So let's load in register 2 with the bit pattern FF. Okay, and let's just be clear, what's the difference between dollar sign and pound sign in this assembly language? Dollar sign refers to what, and pound sign refers to what? Okay, so if you guys could uh, type in the, the stream chat, and he's gone. Oh no, he's still here. Hello, New Getty. Welcome to CS101 at Wabash College. Okay, so uh, what's the difference between dollar sign and pound sign in our uh, assembly language? Yep, okay, so yes, dollar sign is going to refer to a memory address, um, which in the emulator is sort of represented as the position on a grid, uh, and then the hashtag uh, is going to be the actual bit pattern of the actual number. Okay. Uh, then I also need to load in the number 01, uh, or the number 1, and of course in hex that's just 01, and I'll stick that in register 3. Okay, so now we're ready to actually start doing something. And I'm going to leave a space here to, um, to kind of separate out the different little pieces of this program. So what I need to do next is take the number that I've loaded into register 1, whatever it is, and I need to XOR it against register 2. So I need to do, uh, I'm going to put the answer in register 4, and I'm XORing registers 1 and 2. Okay, so this does the flipping the bits part. Okay, so what's in register 4 when this is finished 
is the bit flipped version of register one. Okay, then I need to add one. So I need to add as integers, whatever is in register four, or sorry, I'll put the answer in register five. What am I adding? The bit flip thing that's sitting in register four and the number one, which is sitting in register two. Okay, so I flipped the bits and I added one. Okay, register three. Uh, oh yeah, you're right, thank you. Uh, the number one is in register three. Okay, um, how do you add in integer? Um, well, how do you do uh, integer? So, Filippo, that means to add numbers assuming that they're integers rather than um, as floating points. So, how do you tell the system? Well, uh, this, if you look over on our table, notice that the two add commands have different opcodes. And so, when the processor decodes the opcode, it sees five or six, and if it sees five, it knows to do it as integers, and if it sees six, it needs, knows to do it as floats. Um, okay, so that flipped the bits and they added one, and then we'd want to store our answer, uh, which is sitting in register five, out to memory cell F1. Okay. Um, yeah, so Filippo, this is why um, one thing I did was I made the mnemonics for this, add I versus add F, so that it's obvious when you look at it which kind of addition you're doing. But, uh, of course, since all of this gets translated into just a sequence of zeros and ones, it's the opcode that tells the processor how to decode things. And actually, uh, maybe not today, but at some point, uh, I'll show you guys on the circuit level how you do decoding. Um, it's actually not as complicated as it might sound, um, but, uh, but we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. Okay, so there's our, um, there's our program. So the next thing we need to do, excuse me, is we need to go through And we need to take our assembly code and actually assemble it, okay? So what I want you guys to do is take a couple of minutes and take these instructions. Oh, sorry, we also forgot an instruction. Um, take those instructions and translate them into the actual machine code. So for example, the first one is going to be 1, 1, F, 0. So take a couple of minutes and write out on paper what you think the next ones are going to be, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Okay, so we'll give you guys a bit of a pause here. I'll drink some more water. Looks like we got a decent crew here today. Looks like there's maybe 20 of you guys in the stream chat. And of course, you've all liked and subscribed the Prof McKinney channel of excellence so I can make affiliate and start raking in all the sweet ad money. Not really. All right, so, uh, Filippo, why don't you give me the next instruction here? What is load2ff going to become? Filippo. No idea. Okay. Miles, do you have an idea what the next instruction, how we'll uh, 
encode that one. I'm going to have to break out the Jeopardy music. Because I'll probably get sued. So maybe not. Alright, well. So, here's how do we do this, right? How did I know that the first one was supposed to be 11F0? Well, that's where my table comes in. So look at the first entry on the table. Right? Okay. So, 2... Alright. So, yeah, the next one is going to be 2. What register are we going into? So, I've called it register R here, but which register are we actually sticking it into in this particular instruction? We're sticking it into register number 2. Okay, so um, the R, the X, and the Y, you replace with whatever the specific numbers are for your operation. So think of like R, X, and Y, and S, and T over here as placeholders. They're just uh, generic things, but you're actually going to replace them, all of them, with a number that's 0 through F. Okay? All right, so this one will be 2, 2, F, F. Um, and then the next one will be opcode is still 2 because I'm loading a specific bit pattern. I'm going into register 3. And I'm loading the bit pattern 01. Okay, XOR is opcode 9. We're putting the answer in register 4. And we're um, um, we're uh, using the data that's in registers 1 and 2. Okay, now um, Teague pointed out could I have also used? Could I have also used that? So why is it okay for me to use nine four one two or nine four two one? Why are those? Even though they look different, why do they accomplish exactly the same thing? Mueller, why do they accomplish exactly the same thing? Okay, so my hint here is, does it matter what order you XOR things in? Okay, so is A XOR B the same as B XOR A? And the answer is yes. Okay, and in fact, that's true for all three of the logical operations we have. It's also true for addition, right? 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. So not all operations have this property, uh, but this one does. It is commutative. It doesn't matter what order you put the inputs in. So I could have done it in that order, or I could have done it in this order. Okay? Um, right, so... I'll just leave the first one for cleanliness. All right, so what's the addition command going to be? Well, first off, which opcode do we need? Do we need opcode 5 or opcode 6 here? Oh, Filippo, you sell yourself short, man. All right, so opcode 5 or opcode 6? Which one do we need for our next instruction? Yeah, it's 5 because we're doing addition as integers. Where is the answer going? Register 5. What things are we adding together? Whatever's in registers 4 and 3. Okay. Okay. And then we need to store the answer out to uh, this memory cell F1. So, Mr. Malat, what's that instruction going to be? The whole thing, all four nibbles, please. Three, 
3-5-F-1. 3-5-F-1. Yep, it will be 3-5-F-1. Good. All right, and then our halt command is always the same thing, C-0-0-0. Okay, so now we need to test this thing out and make sure that it actually works. So let me type uh, our instructions. Uh, Uh, all in line like this so that I can easily load them into uh, our website. All right, and then um, let me just click here and then I'm going to replace, um, I'm going to blow this up. I'm going to replace that with our code, hit enter and then refresh it so it loads it in. Um, so, Teague, uh, no, it's okay to use zero, zero. Um, what I think you, you maybe are thinking of is I said don't ever use register zero. Um, and there's an exception for that, but uh, why to avoid register zero is um, because of stuff we'll probably talk about maybe on Monday. Um, so, the... The zero zero that's in C zero zero zero, really the halt command only would occur if you had all four of those things together in row and it was an instruction. So um, yeah, I think I think what you're thinking of is to not use register zero. Um, okay, so uh, and there are situations where we will use register zero, and like I said, we'll talk about that on. Monday, uh, probably. Um, okay, or maybe later today. We'll see how we go. Uh, all right, so the, I needed to put a number in memory cell F0 in order for us to negate it. So what this thing is going to do is it's going to take whatever's in memory cell F0, flip its bits and add 1, and spit out the result to memory cell F1. So what we should get here is the hexadecimal uh, value, okay, so if you look over in the top right, there's this inspector, and if you hover your mouse over, it will show you the address, the hex value, the binary value, and then how to decode that as a signed integer and as a floating point number, um, although there is one exception to this in the floating point department. Um, the uh, I think when we talked floating point, I told you guys the way that the book defined 8-bit floating point is not technically correct um, because they omitted one detail, namely that detail about the hidden one. So uh, Joel uh, Edstrom, who uh, programmed this, uh, this emulator, when he programmed in the floating point decoder, he did it based on the way that the book describes floating point, not the way that I kind of changed the definition to be more consistent with the uh, IEEE 754 standard for floating point. Um, so the floating point decoded values are not going to be correct um, because of the, the two different systems. Uh, fortunately, though, we don't have to worry about it here. All right, so I'm just going to clear and run this, and it's going to start executing the instructions. And the first thing that happened was it loaded things in. And then, there we go, we're finished. The result that went back out into memory is FB. And if we hover over our mouse, we see that that does in fact represent the signed integer negative 5, which was negative of what we started with. Um, okay, so we've written the program. It looks like it works. But it's always a good idea to test it on another situation. So somebody give me another number. That's between negative 128 and 127 and is an integer. 13. Okay. What is the encoding of 13? Do you want hex 13 or do you want the actual base 10 number 13? 
because of course hex 1 3 would be 19 not 13 all right so 13 base 10 so what gentlemen is 13 base 10 expressed in hexadecimal well in hex it's 0 D okay so 0 D is 13 uh, in hex okay um, right so yeah Sam that's the binary uh, for it that's correct and so in hex it would be 0 D um, so the I have to type everything in hex uh, in any of my bit positions here um, but uh, the decoder will show me the binary so um, yeah okay so 0 D is 13 so whatever we get ought to represent minus 13 so let's uh, execute our program again and see what happens and it spits out F3 which if we hover over looks like minus 13 to me all right so it worked um, great looks uh, looks pretty good all right let's try another one so let's try actual hex 1 3 which is really 19 uh, and let's see what it does if we get the negative of that ED and BAM negative 19 okay so for my last trick um, what I'm going to do is let's take something like all zeros so that represents zero what is zeros negative it's still zero right so if I put in zero zero to this program I had better get the same thing out so let's try that and I do okay so that's good it handles that case with a plum all right now here's the the last question uh, zero zero was a bit pattern that when you flip it and add one you get exactly the same thing back as what you started with uh, but there was another bit pattern that had this property okay so what was the other bit pattern that had this weird property that when you computed its negative you got it you got the exact same number back so uh, type it in the in the stream chat you can either type it in hex or binary so what 8-bit uh, number uh, when you flip it and add one you get the same thing back all right so uh, not quite uh, Teague because if you flip FF you're gonna get all zeros but then when you add one you get a one okay um, it was seven no it's not seven Filippo it's a negative number um, and seven I think you may be thinking about uh, uh, if we restrict ourselves to four bits not eight all right so negative 28 base 10 uh, yes it is negative 28 or 128 base 10 which in hexadecimal is eight zero okay so that's one followed by all zeros uh, remember that's what we called the most negative number in whatever number of bits you're using was one followed by all zeros okay so in eight bits you're able to encode minus 128 all the way up to 127 and uh, minus 128 is the smallest number that you can encode so it's the most negative and let's see what happens when I flip that and add one I get the same thing back okay so this does work with that other weird uh, case and the reason that there are two numbers that uh, have this property uh, even though what this basically means is you're asking how many numbers are their own negatives in math class you would say zero and that's it 
but in computing, uh, the arithmetic system is like the clock, not like the number line, um, because you have to work in a finite number of bits. So, um, uh, okay, so our program works. Not too difficult, right? Um, so, let me, uh, why don't we stop on the assembly for here for today. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is, um, let me go to Canvas. Let me go to our actual course. Um, and just remind you guys of the, um, the checkpoint in the peer review. Okay, so, um, I assigned on here, uh, I, I initially did it last night and then I had to redo it because I messed something up. Uh, so I assigned those of you who turned in the, uh, the assignment on time uh, have been assigned two people to peer review. Now, I'm not entirely sure how this will look from y'all's perspective, but you should get um, you should get a reminder or some sort of notification from Canvas. Uh, you should have gotten it this morning at uh, just before 8 or roughly around then as to who your uh, the two people that will be you will be reviewing who they are um, now you may have gotten a similar uh, notification about this last night you can ignore the ones from last night because um, I messed something up and I had to delete everything and redo it so um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how this will look for you guys in Canvas, but um, that's how you'll do it. All right, so um, let's uh, let's take our dear friend uh, Filippo, right? So um, what we could see is if we oh I didn't want to do that. Um, so basically, what um, what you guys will get when you do the peer review. So let's pick on Mr. Filippo, right? So Mr. Filippo, um, well, maybe I shouldn't pick on you because what did Mr. Filippo forget? He doesn't have the design document here. All right, so let's take uh, uh, Reese. Let's pick on our other friend, Reese. All right, so here's Reese's design document along with his link. Okay, so you're going to have this from each of the two people you're going to review, and you can see based on their design document, what it is that they're going for. And then if you click on their link, you'll obviously be able to see their game and see uh, what they have so far. So what you guys want to do is basically play the game after you've read the design document, play it a few times, and uh, what you want to look for are places where there are bugs or places where uh, there are things that that work particularly well uh, or uh, you know things suggestions you might have to improve it or suggestions you might have to uh, to get things more in line with the uh, with their design document um, now one thing I would suggest here is if for example you look at somebody's code and you say oh, actually, this doesn't work, I tried that, and that didn't work, so here's this other thing that I did that worked. What you can do is you can remix, so I could remix uh, Reese's project, okay, and now I have a copy of Reese's project, and so I could go in and I could say, uh, you know, like add things to places, or um, where's the comment block? Um, here it is. I could uh, I could add comment and say like um, this code is really good. Okay, and then I could go somewhere else and I could say, oops, I could say you know add comments like um, I redid this code. Take a look. I think it works better. Okay, so basically you want to uh, kind of help uh, 
help give as, as complete of a review as you can to uh, your partners and uh, you can use the remix basically to make a, a version of it um, and then you can share the URL of your remix back with your partner so that they can see uh, what you tweaked uh, or you can type things in in text and kind of say you know everything looks good but the um, oh my god I'm sorry guys <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm an idiot. I was on my desktop, not my, um, laptop, which is the thing that's streaming right now. All right, let's try this again, shall we? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but now you can see Scratch, or I mean, uh, uh, the website, uh, Canvas, right? Okay, so if we go to the assignment, what you guys will see is, so let's go to Reese. You guys, you know, if you, if you have Reese as somebody you're reviewing, you'll get his design document that, of course, has the link in it. And then what you can do is, if you click Remix, then it will save a copy of it to your account, and then you can edit the code however you want without destroying uh, the original code. Okay, so I was a bonehead for a minute, and um, I started loading Canvas and uh, Scratch on my desktop, which is sitting here next to my laptop. But of course, what computer am I streaming from at the moment? I'm streaming from my laptop. So that's why you guys didn't see anything, because I'm a big dum-dum. Um, Okay, anyway, so uh, point being, though, that within Canvas, right, uh, within the assignment, uh, you will get a notification from Canvas as to who you need to peer review, and these notifications went out just shy of 8 o'clock this morning. Uh, you'll probably see one, uh, you'll probably see two notifications in your email, one from just after midnight and one from 7 55 this morning. You can ignore the ones that were from just after midnight um, because I messed up the, the peer review assignments and I had to delete everything and, and redo it. Um, so, but it should, it should be working now. Um, okay, so uh, if you guys have any questions on that, uh, hit me up on Discord. Um, and uh, just by way of reminder, um, please have your peer reviews uh, you need to have those complete by Sunday evening, 2359, uh, so that next week uh, everybody will have their peer review uh, stuff back to them and can use that as you guys continue to work on your games. All right, well, uh, we'll end the stream here. Thanks for playing. I hope you all have a good weekend. And uh, for those of you who are celebrating Easter, have a good Easter. And for those of you who have been celebrating Passover, have a good Passover. And if you're, uh, if I'm missing any uh, holy days, then uh, sorry. Uh, I hope you have a happy whatever. All right, see you guys on Monday.